What's up everybody, Kurtz and Stewart here, and today I'm going to be showing you how to build a decision tree in C++. So a decision tree is basically a big chain of questions that you ask to make a prediction about something. Example, are you interested in learning about decision trees? If yes, then are you willing to sit through a few more minutes of this video? If yes again, then you're probably going to like this video. See how chaining the questions is useful? Because if you answer no to the first question, then you're probably not going to like this video and I don't have to ask any more questions. But even if you said yes to the first question, if you're not willing to sit through more minutes of this video, then you're probably going to have a bad time. The dilemma we run into now is, what questions do we ask first, right? Like a computer doesn't understand data the same way that humans do, right? So it doesn't know what questions to ask unless we teach it what questions to ask. And the way we teach a computer to do anything is with data. So we need some data, and luckily I've got some right here. This is a bunch of questions that were asked about different computer science classes, and then also students gave their ratings of that class. And what we're going to do is just try and predict whether or not a positive or negative rating was given rather than these like individual numbers because that's actually a lot harder to do. Okay, so to figure out which question we're going to ask first, we're going to score each question. And what we mean by score is we want a higher score to correspond to asking this question getting us closer to making a prediction. And that's actually equivalent to asking this question splitting the data more than other questions, right? So I'll give you an example. The systems class, spoiler alert, is the best question to ask because if you ask whether or not a class is systems and the answer is no, look at this, there's no no's down here. All the no's are in the positive rating section. So if you ask, well, is this question a systems class and the answer is no, then you can immediately guess that the student's going to like the class because apparently no one likes systems classes. Sorry, systems professors. All right, shut up. shut up. You shut That's up. That's why your shoes raggedy. That's why no one shows up to your lectures. We need to formalize this idea of which questions split the data the most. To get a score for a question, we'll take whatever the size of the majority of the answers are for each rating section, add them up, and then divide by the number of rows. Look, I can tell that didn't help at all, so let's go through an example. Look at just the theory column. In the positive section, four people said no, and eight people said yes. The majority of the students answered yes in this section. In the negative section, the majority of six people answered no. Theory gets a 14 out of 20 score. Again, what we're trying to get at here is a way of measuring how well a question splits the data. The greater the majority in each section, the better job that question does at splitting the data. Here are the scores for all the columns. Not surprisingly, systems gets the highest. Great, we've got our first question to ask. Now we can start building our tree. Once we found the question with the highest score, Here's what we do. We partition the data based on the different answers that the students gave. So all the students that said no go over here to the left, and all the students that said yes go over here to the right. Great. And like I said earlier, if students said a class was not a systems class, they unanimously liked it. So we have our first base case, unanimous answers. But what about this other new data set to the right here? Here there is no unanimous answer, and in fact there is no clear guess to be made here at all. So what we do is find the new column with the highest score and split again. Note that we only take this new data set into account for finding the new scores. Essentially, we ignore the systems column and all the rows that said no to systems. In this case, we find that AI is the new column with the highest score. Just like before, all the students that said no to this being an AI class get partitioned and put on the left, and all the others get put on the right. And again, the data set on the left has a unanimous answer case. This time, everyone says they dislike the class. AI truly is the most popular class to take right now. But we also need to do another split on the right child. This time, Morning gets the highest score, and we see something interesting. We run out of data for the no partition. In this case, we'll just guess out of all the possible labels. 
One more split on theory, and we've hit our true base case. We split on all the columns at this point. Here we guess whatever the majority of the labels left are. And we're done building our tree. If you start at the top and then work your way down to the bottom, you can predict any new data points that you want. Alright, so now we're going to start getting into the coding side of things, and I'm going to be using some more technical terms. Instead of questions, I'm going to be saying columns, and instead of responses, I'm going to be saying rows. Instead of ratings, I'm going to be saying labels, and I'm also going to be moving the ratings over to be the last column. These are all just buzzwords that machine learning people use so that they can get jobs. So data is usually stored as a CSV file, which stands for comma separated value file. So take all the data from here and write it down as a CSV file. Now, one thing that we want to keep in mind here is generalizability. So instead of Y's and N's, we're gonna write the data as yeses and nos. This forces us to read them in as strings rather than characters. And I know that this kind of seems like splitting hairs maybe, but you got to remember the famous Dijkstra quote, which was, if you don't think of it now, you're just going to be later on down the line. Okay, so now we have our data in a file, and we're going to start writing C++ code. And the first thing we're going to write is reading the data in. Now, any good programmer knows that when you want to read data in, you go to Google and just look up how someone else did it. So I use this guy's code, which is pretty cool because it reads in characters from lines at a time. So all I'm doing is every time I see a character, I save it to a string. And then every time I see a comma character, I save that string. And the data isn't actually being stored as um, strings. I convert them to integers because processing strings sucks. It's really slow. So all of the actual processing is gonna be done with integers. And uh, another thing about the way I read in the data was I read it into a vector of vectors. Uh, we don't know how much data there is ahead of time, right? We want this code to be generalizable to any data set, so we have to use vectors which can expand dynamically. So if you didn't catch what I just said, we're storing our data as a two-dimensional vector, a vector of in vectors. But that's not the only data structure that we're going to be setting up as we're reading in the data. We also need to keep track of what values each column can take on. This is going to be super helpful when we're calculating the scores in the next section. So we also set up this two-dimensional vector of ints called call vowels. This is what it looks like. And this gets populated as we're reading in the data. Now we've got our data read in and we can think about which column we need to split on, which means we need to calculate the scores for each column. And when you first sit down to do this, the like most naive programmer way to do this is go through each column, like go to a column and then loop over the rows and like count how many ratings you see within each section and then calculate the score from there. But you'll notice that this means that you're visiting every row for each column and you also have to look at the labels for every row for each column you're at. This is like really slow and, it, and when we have a bigger data set than just 20 data points, this slowness is going to really hinder our ability to classify data. So I'm gonna show you guys a way to do this in one swoop over the data and it involves using a three dimensional vector. But there is a problem here. Most of us, when we imagine the third dimension, also imagine energy, change, and life itself as being in the third dimension. Remember that to get the maximum score of a column, we need to get the count of the majority answer for each label type. All right, so there are three elements to this score number, the column, the label type, and the answer type. These will be the three dimensions of our vector that we'll call call counts. The way we populate call counts is by looking at a row of our data, then an element within that row. Based upon the element's value, the row's label, and which column the element sits in, 
we increment the corresponding innermost box here. After a full pass on our data set, here's what call counts looks like. Again, those innermost numbers are counts of how many times each response type or column value shows up within each ratings group or label type, and we generate those counts for all the columns. This is exactly what we needed call values for. Now all we have to do to find the scores for each column is add the maximum counts from each innermost vector in a column and divide by the number of rows. Then just choose the column with the highest score. Alright, so we have a column we want to split on and now we can talk about actually building a tree by splitting the data. So when we're doing the actual tree building in our code, the, the splitting specifically, we're not going to create a copy of the data each time we create a node. This would just take up a lot more space than necessary. So what we're going to do is have a mask that gets copied for each node and just keep a single copy of the data. And here's what the mask would look like for the first node on the right. And you can see all the rows with yes for systems are blacked out. And also the middle column systems itself will get blacked out, but that gets really messy, so I didn't draw it here. And so when we go to get a new column to split on at a node other than root, all we have to do is use the normal scoring function that we used on root, but ignore the rows that are blacked out by the mask. And then we've got a way to split nodes. Let's talk about how to actually produce the nodes themselves. Building a tree in C++ is just like anything else in C++. It's harder to do than it should be because there's some subtlety involved. We're going to build our tree out of structs called nodes. And these structs are going to have four values, which is call val. So this is the value that if this is the arm of the that reaches to the node, this is the value on top of the arm. The second value in our struct is going to be call split on. If this node is not a base case, then it'll have the value of the column that this node is getting split on. The third value of the struct is going to be guess, which is if the node is a base case, then this will be the guess returned by the node. And the fourth value that each struct is going to have is a vector of pointers to other nodes. This is so that we can actually attach new children to a node. Why can't we just have a vector of actual nodes? Well, this is the subtlety I was talking about. If you do the right Google phrasing, then you'll find this Stack Overflow answer, which explains it pretty well. Basically, when the computer goes to allocate space for that node in our constructor, then it would see, well, this has a vector of nodes, and it would have to go and allocate space for those nodes, and then for each of those nodes, it would have to allocate space for the vector of nodes that that one, and then it would just, you would get infinite space. So we have to deal with pointers, unfortunately. All right, so the way we're actually gonna build our tree is you start with a root and then find the column to split on. Based on the column to split on, you add a child to the root for each value of that column, and then you use a recursive function to repeat that process for each of the children. Recursive functions are pretty conceptually confusing and they're also really hard to debug so when I did this I just did a non-recursive build of the tree just to make sure that everything was working and then I switched it over to this really nice looking recursive function at this point I know what you're saying you're saying Kirsten this has been so easy to follow and it doesn't feel like you've rushed through anything. And I just want to thank you for saying that uh, and just acknowledge that you're correct. At this point, you should have a tree of nodes and all you have to do to predict a new data point is start at the root and 
check the value that your data point has for the column that the root splits on and then follow the child from the root that has that value and then repeat that process until you hit a base case. To wrap this up in a nice little function that keeps track of how many guesses the tree actually gets correct and you have a classifier that keeps track of its own accuracy. So to test it, I grabbed the data set from Kaggle and ran it on the tree classifier. It's a car data set. Thank you, Doa El Sanani. The tree does terrible. It's just awful. And this is because car prices, which is what we're trying to predict, are too fine a space to be predicting with a tree. There's just too many discrete values. So I cheated a little bit and I wrote a Python script that reduces how fine the car prices are. It just takes the range of the car prices and maps them to a certain number of prices within that range. And the tree still does pretty terrible, but if we reduce it to only four prices to predict on, then we do get some better results. When we reduce to four prices and we train on the entire data set, it takes about six hours and it gets about 30% accuracy. Our tree might not have done very well on this task in particular but it would probably do pretty well on a binary classification task. And no matter which way you cut it, building a tree is just a slow process because you have to run through every possible child that a node might have for every node, and that just takes up a lot of time. One improvement that could be made here would be to not just randomly guess from all the labels when we run into the no data base case, but to remember what labels were left leading up to that base case. We could also apply this idea to the no more columns left to split on base case. So instead of just taking the majority label, you remember what the majorities were leading up to that base case. Um, that would get pretty complicated pretty quickly, but I think that would help the accuracy of the tree. In conclusion, even though decision trees are not the fastest, or the most accurate. They are fun to build and study. And I hope you got something out of watching this video. I have uploaded all the code that I wrote for this up to GitHub and I commented the living crap out of it. So hopefully you guys should be able to make sense of it. And I'm also going to make a list of all the songs that I used in this video. So don't worry about that. Check the description below for that. And uh, take care guys. Yeah.